we are in a new series that's called Change the Story. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I'll be there in a moment. And uh, if you uh, have notes, pull those out. Um, if you like to take notes on your phone, if perhaps you just like to memorize what I say, that's fine too. But I want you to engage. Engage in this message. Uh, I've been feeling this one for several months, and I'm very excited to speak this message today on changing the story. As we walk into it, I just think about this as uh, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's John 8, 32. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's why. To change the story, you have to change what you believe. To change the story, you have to change what you believe. And the reason why is this, because behind every sin I do is a lie I believe. And so it's not just changing behaviors. The gospel is not a good news about behavior modification. What God wants to do is transform us from the inside out. That's why Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So... We don't replace lies with nothing. We replace lies with truth. Lies go out the back door when truth comes in the front door. And so we're developing new patterns of thinking, all of us here, everyone, myself included. We have a voice that we've listened to. It's became familiar. And so under stress, we tend to believe those lies, that voice. And it tends to, we fall back into old patterns. The reason why, maybe you know someone or you yourself are trying to overcome something. But then you start to drift back into that voice. You know, Here we go again. I knew it wasn't going to happen. I knew that this is going to. And we believe those, th- that, that false pattern of thinking. And so we want to, in this series address that and change the story. So we are in this series going to talk about eight lives that Jesus wants you to stop believing. Eight lies that Jesus wants you to stop believing. And the reason why is when he renews our mind, the Bible says, then we're able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You'll never know what God's will is until you know God's word. And God has to renew our minds. All the pollution needs to get away. Think about all that we've collected in our life, all those lies that we've believed. And so we need, and, and, and you or someone you know, you know they've been believing lies. You go, why are they doing this? Why are they acting out? They get better and then they go back. And why is this happening? Because if you were to drill down, there's still a lie they're believing. And uh, there's something in cognitive brain science that's called illusionary truth effect. Have you heard of that? Illusionary Truth effect. And that's this, that if you hear something enough, it's repeated often enough, you believe it's true. And it's not true. But you've heard it enough that you think it's true. Illusionary truth effect. And so let me give you some examples of that one, okay? And I actually, I was studying these, and I, you know, and I still, like, I'm, I'm like, struggling. I'm like, yeah, but I'm researching, because, like, they still feel true to me, because I've heard them. Here's one, okay? Um, carrots make your eyesight better, Right? Well, now, first of all, carrots are good for you, so eat carrots. But they don't make your eyesight better. But even right there, as I said that, some of you go, well, now hang on here. I'm going to have to fact check this because I, can I trust this guy? Preaches with his buttons popping off. <laughs> if you were to look at where that came from, it was during World War II where uh, the British had developed a new technology of radar, but they didn't want the Nazis to know. And so they spread a lie that uh, their pilots were able to see the Nazi planes at night because they were eating carrots. <laughs> so we go around saying carrots make your eyesight better. You, some of you still, right now, you're still going, I don't know if I can trust you on this one. <laughs> Here's another one, okay? All right, we only use 10% of our brain. And who said that? Einstein. Except for, it's not true, Andy didn't say it. Again, some of you right now going, I don't know if we can trust you, Wes. You know, you study the brain, even resting, the brain is all firing up, using more than 10%. And Einstein never said it, but the fact that someone said Einstein said it says that you believe it's true, and it's not true. The only people it's true for are the ones who believe it. I didn't get that. Um, Here's another one. An apple a day keeps a... Only true if you eat the peel. Here's another one, okay? From space, you can see the Great Wall of China. Okay, so not true. And I actually went on NASA's website because I, like, I still think it's true. 
And once you're past 180 miles, apparently, because I haven't done it, you can't see the Great Wall of China. You're not seeing it from space. But we've heard it, and we've repeated it, and others have repeated it, so we think it's true. There are lies that have been repeated so many times that you believe it's true, and it's actually keeping you from your full potential in Christ. And Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we fall back into what's familiar. There's a term in cognitive science that's called processing fluency. Processing fluency that says this, is that under stress, we fall back to what's familiar. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to heal our minds from lies that we believed and set us free. When we believe these lies, it impacts how we live. And today I'd like to talk about the first lie in this series. And the first one is this. You can write this down. I am not worthy of love and belonging. Now, if I said, raise your hand if you believe that's true, no one's going to raise their hand. No one's going to be like, I actually, no, because when you raise your hand, you look around, you feel like you don't belong. It's like immediately you're part of the outside group. But have you had times in your life that you look back and you feel like you don't fit, you don't belong, you don't fit in, you're not worthy? I remember for me walking into middle school lunch and looking around, I, I didn't know where I was going to sit. I didn't see any of my friends. And no one said, hey, Wes, over here. <laughs> And I just stood there, and I'm like, I am not worthy of love and belonging. In fact, one of the most powerful things you can do as a student is at lunch, go sit with other people. Invite people to sit with you. It's amazing what happens. Jesus does this all through the Gospels. It's amazing what happens when people feel like they belong. Um, here's another one. Uh, I'd kind of built my identity around basketball, and in seventh grade, I got cut from the team. And I can remember, um, like, trying to figure out, because I lived close enough to walk, and I didn't walk straight home because I didn't know what I was going to say to my parents. I am not worthy of love and belonging. Maybe for you, it was when you got held back in school. Maybe when somebody broke up with you, and you're like, no one broke up with me. Admit it, they broke up. <laughs> I broke up first. No, they broke up. <laughs> um, a relationship ended. Maybe, maybe, maybe you feel like a failure because you got a D or an F on something. And it's not just that, that, that you failed on the project. You feel like a failure. Or I heard somebody say, my marriage failed, so I felt like a failure. Somewhere in your life, at some time in your life, you believe this lie, that you are not worthy of love and belonging. And when we believe that, what we do is this, we avoid people. We avoid specifically people that remind us that we don't feel like we belong. In fact, I even see it like sometimes you might feel at church like you don't fit in. You might feel like you don't belong as part of God's family. And, and, or maybe you felt like you did, but then you made some mistakes and you haven't been around in a while. And then you see me at a store and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> and I don't say that word, but you thought it. And there's this immediate like, I don't fit in. I don't belong. Uh, there's, 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 um, there's these people we, we avoid. And not only that, there's walls we build. We, we build these walls to protect ourselves, not recognizing that when we build these walls, we're actually walling off love. You, you, you can't build deep friendships without vulnerability. You'll never have a really intimate marriage until you're vulnerable. But when you're vulnerable, you can also be hurt. And so we let down, so we don't want people to hurt us, so we build these walls. But all of a sudden, we feel isolated, we feel alone. The great poverty in America is loneliness. We get jaded, you get kind of sarcastic. You're sarcastic to protect yourself. Um, we can get to where we deflect. Somebody, we, we use humor to kind of just move the subject or we want to turn everything into an argument. And this is, um, this is not just you or me. This is this woman that we're going to read about today in John chapter 4. This is a woman who's avoiding people. This is a woman who feels she's not worthy of love and belonging. This is a woman who feels like a failure because she's had marriages fail. This is a woman who feels like she needs to have walls to protect herself. This is a woman who needs to deflect into arguments because she doesn't want to have to address some of the real issues in her life. And who's safe? And is this church safe enough for somebody to come and receive the message of the gospel where they need it the most? In John chapter 4, let me give you the setting. Jesus had been doing ministry in um, Judea. That's towards the south. And you have of uh, that Palestine area. And Jerusalem. And Jesus had been doing ministry there. 
And he, it was said that he was baptizing more people than even John the Baptist, which if your nickname's Baptist and people are baptizing people more than you, I mean, come on. And so the religious leaders had found this out and the popularity of Jesus was rising, but with the popularity, you're also making enemies as well. Because one step in front, you're the leader, but 10 steps in front, you're the target. And so the Bible says that Jesus left Judea and he heads to Galilee. Now, Galilee's in the north. And Capernaum is where his home base is. That's where he probably lived. And um, where the fishing village where he met Peter, James, Andrew, John, them. And so he's going to head. I actually drew a little picture for you guys. Um, he, so he's in Judea. <laughs> and excuse some of, some of my, my penmanship. Um, He's in Judea, and he's going to head to Galilee. It's about 200 miles. You see Capernaum at the, there at the top of the Sea of Galilee. And so about halfway-ish, not quite, is uh, Samaria or Sychar. Sychar, the city there where there's the well of, of Jacob, Jacob's well. And Mount Gerizim is the holy place for Samaria so they don't have to go to Jerusalem because there has been 700 years of tension between Jews and Samaritans. And this tension goes back to a time where they were once part of the same nation, same family, and they had a divorce. And so they don't talk to each other, and the people of Samaria intermarried with other nations around them. So the Jews saw them as a mixed breed, and, and there's racial tension. They, don't, they avoid each other. In fact, sometimes a good Jew would, instead of going straight through, because you can see how it's a straight passage, would actually go all the way around because they didn't want to see another Samaritan. And the Samaritan didn't want to see a Jew. But the Bible says here in John chapter 4 that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And I think it had to go through. He didn't have to because you could go around, but he had to. And I think about this. Jesus is not avoiding the people who are avoiding him. And Jesus is not avoiding you. And Jesus is not avoiding your loved ones. And Jesus is heading right for us when we need him the most. And so here's Jesus on his way. He stops there at Sychar, and there's this well. And these wells, maybe 100 feet down, they would have uh, on top of them a capstone. Some of your Bibles say that Jesus sat beside the well. Mine says beside the well. Some of you say on the well. Um, literally, he is on the well. It just doesn't make sense to us. We're like, how is he sitting on the well? What if he fell in? Well, they have a capstone that goes on top of the well. There'd be a hole in the middle where you'd bring your bucket down with a rope and back up. And they would have that there. It's actually kind of nice because you can set your jar or your bucket there before you transfer it to your head. So Jesus is sitting on the well. <laughs> he sent the disciples into town to get some lunch. Okay? Now, the only time that people would come to the well, for the most part, if you lived there, would be in the morning or in the evening, not in the middle, hottest time of the day. Although there could be if you ran out of water or travelers coming through. And so Jesus is sitting there. They didn't have a bucket with them. They're like, hey, let's travel 100 miles with a bucket. And so they're going to go to the store, get some food, hopefully come back with a bucket. <laughs> Jesus is sitting on this well, and here comes this woman, the Bible says, at noon to draw water. It says in verse 7, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Samaritan woman coming in the middle of the day, she's believing this lie. I am not worthy of love and belonging. She clearly is avoiding people in her life. There are people who would be there in the morning. And she didn't fit in with that group, probably because of some decisions she had made, some failures in her life, relationships. With these broken relationships, there's probably people that they were connected to that knew them. And so it would be a place of rumors and people talking. And, and so it was a reminder. Every time she went there in the morning or in the evening and saw people, it was a reminder that she doesn't belong. So she's coming in the middle of the day to avoid people. Some might even say to meet somebody that would be a passenger or somebody who is a, a visitor who's traveling through town. Perhaps I can meet a man and fill a void that I feel I have in my life. Have you been trying to fill voids with people that only God can fill? This woman comes and Jesus asks her, he says, can I have a drink of water? Would you give me a drink? You know, we hear that and we're like, I, I'm thinking no big deal, right? You thinking no big deal? Like he's thirsty, you have a bucket, could I have some water? But Jesus is breaking three social codes right there. The first one is this. He's a man. It's the Middle East. He's in public. He's talking to a woman. In that time, in some places, even, in some places, even now, in public, a man wouldn't speak to a woman in public. Um, in fact, in some places, not even to their wife. And somebody's like, I don't speak to my wife in public. Okay, but that's a problem. <laughs> Talk about that later. That's a different one. And so uh, he breaks this by being a man. He's speaking to a woman. One of the things that you read in the Gospels, Jesus elevating the place of women in that society. The second thing you see is this, is he is a Jew and he's speaking to a Samaritan. She even says that. Why are you a Jew speaking to me a Samaritan? She's surprised because of the racial tension. 
If you were to go back 300 years, you would see that when Greek was spreading their empire, they used Samaria as a staging grounds for them to attack Jerusalem. If you were to go a couple hundred years later, there was kind of like a revenge factor where Jews went up to Mount Gerizim and and tried to destroy that area as a way of getting back at the Samaritans. So they have all this tension between them. So why are you a Jew speaking to me a Samaritan? This is Jesus breaking that code in that day. And third is this, is he actually is saying, can I have a drink from your cup? You go back in America, there was a very, very ter- this sad, sad era in our nation where there would be two bathrooms. There would be a bathroom for those who are white and those who are colored. Jesus is saying, I, I would like to have a drink from your water fountain. Jesus approaches this woman from a place of weakness and need, not from strength. Too often the church tries to approach the community from a place of strength. Hey, we're awesome. You need help, clearly, so let us help you so you can be awesome like us. So that's not the gospel. In fact, you'll notice that Jesus, when he sends out his disciples, he's like, go out, but don't bring anything. I'm like, no, bring some stuff. Why? He sends them out without what they need so they can meet people that can help them. And the people that help them become people who are part of the mission. For so often, I thought I could meet people by helping them, but I'm not even that helpful, (laughs) It's interesting how we, I meet people better when they're helping me. Coming in from a place of, of humility, Jesus says, can I have a drink from your cup? And she's, she's surprised. Why are you a, a man speaking to me? Why are you a Jew speaking to me, a Samaritan? And Jesus says to her in verse 11, these words, or verse 10, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So this could even be seen at this point as a bit of a, is this a, is this a relationship hookup? She, think about this. Jesus is sitting there. Woman comes. In that culture, Jesus should have got up, given her about 20 feet space so she can get water, she can leave, and then he goes back. But he sits there, and he converses with her in public. And then he says, can I have a drink from your cup? Like, is that like a come online? <laughs> and then she says, you know, like, why are you talking to me? And he's like, if you only knew the gift in front of you, which I've tried that line. It doesn't work that well. <laughs> Didn't even work on Carrie. You know? What's happening here is, is like, she's not sure what's happening. And so he says to her, if you knew, you'd ask me, I'd give you living water, which is fresh water. It's water that's flowing. So it's not the well water that could become stagnant, but it's it's a water that you don't have to keep coming back for. And so she says in verse 15, please, sir, give me this water. And why, why does she want it? She says, I won't be thirsty again, and I won't have to come back here. She's thirsty. She's empty. She doesn't want to have to come back here because it's a reminder that she once again is not worthy of love and belonging. Every time she comes there, it's a a reminder, I'm failed. I don't fit in here. I'm not one of them. (laughs) And what does Jesus say? Go get your husband. Where is this going? She says, I don't have a husband. Maybe this is going somewhere. And he says, I know, you've had five and the one you're with now isn't your husband time out. That got really serious really fast. So often we have so many walls. We don't want to address the elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about it. And if we do, it isn't from a place of humility and love. It's from a place of judgment. So we either don't talk about it or when we talk about it, we talk down to it. <laughs> and Jesus says, I know you don't have a husband. The one you're with, it, five, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now isn't your husband. And I love her response. She's like, sir, you're a prophet. <laughs> Good guess. And what did she do? She deflects. So she, you see, she's been avoiding people. She put up walls, but then Jesus kind of like threw the connection, kind of got her to bring her wall down a little bit. But then when he went there, she immediately deflects to someplace else. She turns it into a religious political debate. Hey, you Jews think the holy place is in Jerusalem, while we Samaritans know, I like no, we know, that the holy place is really Mount Gerizim. If you were to go back, you'd really see that that was a holy place before your holy place, because our holy place is holier than your holy place. <laughs> so where, and she asks us, where's the right place to worship? Christians are fighting about this today. Whose church is better than the other church? What denomination has the right beliefs? Where's the right place to go to worship? We still 
fight about this. Why? Because if you're to go past, there's this deep, deep lie in our hearts that we aren't worthy of love and belonging. So we have to create some kind of in-group that we're with so that that way we don't feel alone. And Jesus says the time is coming, and it's even here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. She says, where is the holiest place to worship? And Jesus says, in your heart. Uh, Come on now, I thought that was gonna, come on. Don't make me pop a button. Where is the right place to worship? Where is the right church? What's the church that, and Jesus says, let me tell you, it's not where's the right church, it's what's the right heart? What's the right spirit? God does not dwell in, in, in buildings made by human hands, but God builds, he, he lives in human's hearts. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? God dwells in you, bought you, paid with you, with a price, Jesus Christ on the cross. God's spirit is filling the church. It is human hearts. And something inside of her said, that is right. I've always thought that. Listen, when we're sharing Christ with one another and people in our community, you have to prove God. Where in the Bible does God go, let me prove I'm here? (laughs) (laughs) This is as much proof as God gives us. In the beginning, God. That's all you get. Because that why inside of every human person, inside of every human being is a soul. And that soul, when that soul hears truth, the soul comes alive and says that's true and fires up. Because we're born physically alive but spiritually dead. And when you say yes to Christ and the gift of God, what happens is God's spirit fills you and you come alive. We've got too many people walking around spiritually dead. God says, I want you to come alive in Christ. And she says, we know that the Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to be the Savior. He's going to set things right. And Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 27, these words, I am the Messiah. The name of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, I am that I am. This is how God reveals himself. This is the first place that we recognize that God, is, 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 God has a name. God has a name and a character. This is who God is. I am. I am. The Gospel of John is famous for what's called seven I am statements where Jesus says, I am. I am the bread of life as he feeds the 5,000. I am the light of the world. I, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the life and the resurrection. He who believes in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. Seven times in John, Jesus says, I am. But before he ever revealed himself to anybody, he met a woman who'd been avoiding everybody in the middle of the day, who had a past and baggage, who had five marriages that failed, who had a lot of people that she felt judged by, and Jesus met her at a well and said, I am. And God is not avoiding you. He's coming for you. When we sing, I was out in the lobby last night, and this guy came up to me, he said, that song, Jesus Leaves the 99, sounds great. Like, who's the 99, and why is he leaving them? (laughs) I forget, right? It's a story that Jesus told of of a shepherd with 100 sheep. And one strays away and he goes and gets them. And Jesus is going for each one. What does this woman do when she starts to hear this? Her life has changed. The lie she had been believing is this, is I'm not worthy of love and belonging. And the truth she begins to believe is this. You can write this down. Jesus knows and loves me. I am known completely and I'm loved unconditionally. Jesus knows me and loves me. Jesus knows everything about you, and he loves you. You are loved and embraced by God. The place, the elephant in the room you don't want anyone to bring up, Jesus will bring up, and he'll embrace you. What happens to this woman? This truth transforms her. What happens when I believe truth? The first thing that happens is this, is I repent. (laughs) I repent. I know that word's not super popular. It's in the Bible. That's what it is. You're like, what is repent? It's the... It's, it's the Greek word, metanoia, it means to change your mind. It literally means to rethink your life. I rethink my life. I was heading this way, I turn around, and I'm going to go in a different direction. You don't add Jesus to your life. He adds you to his. 
You turn around and you begin to follow him. You repent. She, she, all of a sudden, she's been avoiding everybody. What is she going to do? She's going to drop her bucket, her jar that she came, and she's going to, now she's got she's going to head into the village. Listen, when you meet Jesus, he changes your priorities. She heads into the village, and what does she say? Come and meet a man who told me everything I've ever done. Now, I want you to think about this. This is the woman who's avoiding everybody, doesn't want anyone to know. She's got five failed marriages. She's living with a guy now she's not even married to, but they're living as though they're married. And she meets Jesus. She goes to the very people she's been avoiding and says, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, I want you to think about that. If next week we said, you know what? No, we're doing a special. We're doing a special new life weekend. And what we're going to do is this, is I'm going to tell everybody everything you've ever done. How would you invite to that? Hey, want to come next week? My pastor's going to talk about everything I've ever done. Oh, people would come. <laughs> oh, people would come. It's like the worst icebreaker in a small group. All right, um, let's kind of open it up. Uh, let's talk, maybe everyone, uh, your worst sin. How about you go? our fear, isn't it? We got walls up. I'm avoiding people. I'm deflecting. I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with any of that. <laughs> it's called love. And when she meets love and she meets grace and truth married in Jesus Christ, we see on the cross where God forgives us without lowering his standards. We see here when she meets truth, when she meets grace, she immediately, she heads in a different direction. And what she does is, secondly, is this is... She, she begins to witness to people. So I start to witness. I tell others what I've experienced. I mean, you talk to, like, the word witness is where Jesus told us, Acts 1-8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You're going to tell other people about what you've experienced. Now, a witness isn't a judge. You're not going around judging everybody. It's not a defense attorney. So you're not trying to prove that God really is there and he needs you to, no, he doesn't need that. He's okay. He's got it covered. Be a witness. You tell others what you've experienced. Doesn't mean that you're a salesperson, although unless you're a salesperson, be a salesperson. It doesn't mean you're a scholar unless you're super smart and please do that. But a witness is simply somebody who shares what they've experienced. Now, think about this. You talk to Christians like, well, I don't think I could do that. I mean, if you're the the devil, that's what you want. I, 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 and I tell you why we don't do it. We're afraid of rejection. Still somewhere deep, we believe this lie that we're not worthy of love and belonging. And if I share about what I experienced, I could be rejected. And once again, I'm in the outside group. But listen, this is how you grow. Had somebody say to me, Wes, I shared my faith, and I didn't realize this. I felt like I was growing. You are. It's not the last step that you get once you know everything. It's the very next step once you've met Jesus. Go. Be his witnesses. Share what you've experienced. Tell others. The third thing that happens is this is I invite others to come and see. That's what she said. She said, come and see. Come and see. And I want to just ask this question. And I got, this is a question I'm asking myself, and it comes from a place of um, not judgment. It comes from a, like a place of, um, of just deep thought. I've been just going, Wes, like, when's the last time that you invited someone to come sit with you in one of our gatherings? When we are experiencing the power of God's love and grace, we naturally tell people and we naturally invite people to, to just come and see. But when we're not and we're afraid of rejection, the last thing I'd ever want to do is invite somebody that could say no. Like I already had that happen in 10th grade for the dance. This is an area where God wants to heal. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This woman at the well, Samaritan woman, we don't really know exactly what happened to her other than she goes, she shares, she asks people to come and see. They do. This village comes. Jesus stays two more days as she shares what she's experienced. And those people who came for two days come, become followers of Christ. And church tradition in the, the Eastern Orthodox would say that this, they believe this woman to be the woman by the name of Fotina who became a missionary and that she and her family began to go and spread the gospel 
The word photina comes from the word light. This is the woman at the well. Where in your life have you been avoiding people and others? And as you come into the light, you experience not rejection, love and belonging. On your way in here, you got a connection card. Looks like this. This is a moment, if you would pull this out, for you to communicate, this is what God's doing in my heart. Um, I, I try to do it every single week. I want to draw your attention to one thing on here. It says, send me this week's scriptures. I've made a, lift, a list of scriptures that I want to send you that I think are going to help you this week to replace old lies with new truth. Okay? I love to text those to you. I just need your phone number, and, uh, which sounds a little odd. But if you would mark that. And then there's some other things there. On the bottom it says, there's a lie that I've been believing. And here, here, here's what I, I did. Is I took this card out. And do you have one of these in your program. It's just a three-by-five card. If you don't have one now, go home and do this. And I pulled this out. And I'm going to look at this during this series. And on one side I wrote, lie. And so in this series, we're going to talk about eight lies that Jesus wants you to stop believing, but maybe I won't hit yours. I might not hit yours. And we're going to talk about how maybe I might feel like it's too late, or I feel like, you know, like I deserve the bad things that are happening to me, or I'm trapped by my circumstances, or um, God's mad at me and I failed him too much. I don't, we're going to talk about a bunch of them, but I'm, I might miss yours. But I'm going to ask you to write it down. Um, this is the lie that I battle and um, when I say it, you, you, I think you'll understand why. But this, the lie I battle is this, is that Wes Davis is defined, I am defined by my successes and failures. And it leads me often to a place of dr drive that comes from not a good place, but from a bad place. That I'm defined by my successes and failures. And on the other side, I wrote this truth for myself. I am a beloved son of God. I like that side. Two months, we're going to be here. Flip the script. Let Jesus change the story. Would you stand with me? With your head bowed, eyes closed, private moment with you and God. How many are here and you say, you know what, Wes, there's a lie I've been believing. And maybe it's this one. I am not worthy of love and belonging. And you want Jesus to heal you right now in this place. If that's you here today, if you just lift your hand up and say, I want to set free all over this room. Wow. All over this room, you'd raise your hand and say, that's me. Maybe you want to receive Christ in this moment. You can do that right now. How many would just say this? I have a loved one that's battling a lie and they keep falling back and I just, they're heavy on my heart and I'm praying for them because I want the truth to set them free. Would you raise your hand and you're praying for them? Heavenly Father, in this room, you see us as we stand before you, broken but beloved. We're your kids and we belong in your family. As you're standing there, would you just say that I belong in God's family? because I belong to Christ. We are known and loved by you in the deepest part of our lives. We've had experiences where we felt like we didn't fit in or we failed. We felt like we're defined by our successes or our failures. And in this moment, in eternity, something's happening. People are being set free in Jesus' name. You're gonna walk out of here lighter. You're going to walk out of here, maybe go directly to somebody to share your story and be the witnesses. God, would you spread your message through your people all around Kitsap and beyond as we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because we've encountered you, Jesus, at a place where we've been trying to avoid everybody. If you're receiving Christ where you're standing, feel the embrace of your Father say, welcome home. If you're praying for somebody, the Spirit is saying to you, don't give up. Keep praying. God's Spirit is working. And together, God, we're going to sing your praise. Jesus, this is all about you. We're going to study your words. We're going to sing of your name. We're going to spread your message and believe, Jesus, you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Change the story in Jesus' name.